The Venezuelan people mobilized in support of President Nicolas Maduro and in rejection of the sanctions imposed by the United States. Palestine Muslim worshippers commemorate Eid al Adha or Feast of Sacrifice amidst buildings devastated by Israeli bombardment in the Gaza Strip. Countries of the Global South do not sign the final declaration of the summit on Ukraine and claim that there is no point in discussing the possibility of ending the conflict without the participation of Russia. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resto Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news, and we do so in Venezuela. People continue to demonstrate in support of President Nicolas Maduro's policies and against the sanctions imposed by Washington. In the municipality of Bermudez, in the state of Sucre, people joyfully took to the streets to show their support for the candidacy of Nicolas Maduro in the next July 28th presidential elections. Venezuela's United Socialist Party first vice president, Diosado Cabello, led the demonstration and he urged people to continue motivating voters to achieve victory in the next presidential elections. Cabello said that the United People of Venezuela is getting ready to see a resounding electoral victory in honor of Commander Hugo Chavez on his birth, 70th anniversary. The 1x10 is the most powerful force we have to make a quantum leap, a qualitative leap to add in people who are aware that hopes for a peaceful country lie in the hands of the Bolivarian Revolution. We must act. The great patriotic cluster, the social movements, everyone enrolled in the 1x10, x7, so that on the 28th, we may celebrate Commander Chavez's seventh birth anniversary with a victory for Nicolás. In Colombia, the House of Representatives approved the pension reform promoted by Gustavo Petro's government. The pension reform was approved with 88 votes in favor. It would now be reviewed before being submitted to the president for its enactment. President Petro explained that this reform seeks to change the pension system, which left close to 3 million elderly people without any type of pension or savings, and to whom a pension bonus of 230,000 pesos per month will be granted. Colombian head of state also described the approval of this reform as the main social conquest of the country's working people in a long time. And today we have a pension reform, which was really the objective. I believe that whatever came out of the Senate can be improved in the regulation. Those of us responsible for pushing this pension reform have the obligation to present a bill that modifies whatever went wrong in the Senate's draft. Twenty-five. Let's see its main aspects in the following document. The pension reform maintains the retirement age at 57 for women and 62 for men, but extends the system so that everyone can benefit from resources even if they have not contributed enough in salaries. In the case of women, the bill will follow the ruling of the Constitutional Court and reduce the weeks of contribution for women to a thousand weeks, adding a gender bonus. In general, it will help to get out of extreme poverty, the three million elderly men and women who today are outside of any benefit in Colombia. The non-aligned movement and the G77 group plus China through their joint coordinating committee are pushing for Cuba to be taken out of the list of countries that allegedly sponsor terrorism. In the statement issued on Friday, June 14th, the non-aligned movement and the G77 plus China denounced the inclusion of Cuba in the list by the U.S. State Department on countries that sponsor terrorism as unjust and unfounded, which only serves as a pretext for imposing additional unilateral coercive measures against Cuba by taking the economic, commercial and financial blockade against the island to an unprecedented level. The non-aligned movement and the G77 plus China declaration urges for strict compliance with the 31 resolutions passed at the United Nations General Assembly on the necessity to end the U.S. blockade against Cuba, and they call on the U.S. government to end its over six decades old blockade on Cuba for it hinders Cuba's economic development. The group of 77 plus China is made up of 134 states, while the non-aligned movement brings together 121 member states and 18 observers. 
The Simon Bolivar training ship of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela arrived from Sao de in Santiago de Cuba in a visit that takes place within the framework of the 34th training cruise abroad in 2024. The Venezuelan ship will remain in the Greater Antilles from this Saturday, June 15th to Wednesday, June 19th and may be visited by citizens from Sunday 16th to Thursday 18th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. local time. It will then continue its journey to the city of Santa Marta in Colombia and Wilmstad, Curaçao, to end its trip in the Venezuela port of La Guaira on July 13th. According to the Venezuelan Ministry of People's Power for Defense, the 34th training cruise for abroad will last approximately three months, during which it will sail some 4,500 nautical miles and visit several Caribbean and Latin American ports. Venezuela, Venezuela the Venezuelan people with the revolutionary conscience, in spite of sailing in turbulent waters, as a result of the unilateral coercive measures imposed on us by the United States and its allies, Venezuela will arrive safely to port, in victory, in battle. In struggle, under the leadership of our President Nicolas Maduro, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. We are ambassadors wherever we go, always projecting the message of union and fraternity when we talk about peace. We are talking about the absence of war. We are talking about respect for each other's identity, to carry the message as such. In addition to it is part of the Bolivarian diplomacy under the strategic guidelines of the state of the Bolivarian revolution, and we are the platform instruments to bring to the different ports where we arrive. Let's take a short break now, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Palestine Muslim worshippers commemorate Eid al-Adha, or Feast of Sacrifice, amidst buildings devastated by Israeli bombardment in the Gaza Strip. Hundreds of citizens gather amidst the rubble of houses and buildings in the Jabal refugee camp in the north of the Palestinian enclave during the four days of the Feast of Sacrifice. Muslims test their faith by slaughtering livestock and distributing meat to the poor. However, this year, Gaza and families face the holiday with food shortages and deep grief due to the loss of loved ones during the ongoing Israeli siege. Since last October, at least 37,296 Palestinians have been killed by Israel and more than 85,000 have been injured. This seed is completely different. We've lost many people, there's a lot of destruction. We don't have the joy we usually have every Eid, no sacrifices of animals. We usually come to the Eid prayers cheering, with smiles everywhere on the streets. This Eid, I've come to the Eid prayers morning, I've lost my son. The United Nations Department for Children warns of rising temperatures threatening to display children in Gaza Strip. UNICEF detailed that the situation of children in the refugee camps is worsening due to the beginning of the hot season that intensifies the sanitary crisis. About 90% of them suffer from extreme food poverty and lack access to clean water and basic necessities. According to the latest report of the body, more than 3,000 children in Gaza live in severe malnutrition and are at risk of death due to the lack of medical attention caused by the aggressions and blockades of Israel. The United Nations World Food Program warned of a water and sanitation catastrophe in the southern part of the devastated Gaza Strip. WFP Deputy Executive Director Carl Scow said his main concern is the one million displaced people in Rafah and the situation around the overcrowded refugee camps. Palestinians face widespread hunger because the war has largely cut off the flow of food, medicine and other supplies. According to the UN, more than one million people in Gaza could experience the highest level of famine by mid-July. main concern coming out is really what's happening in the south with the hundreds of thousands up to a million of people who have been displaced uh, out of Rafah who is now stuck in a very uh, 
crammed space between uh, Rafa or Khan Yunis uh, and, and on the beach uh, uh, in Der el-Bala. Uh, I mean, here we have really a protection disaster uh, and uh, a water and sanitation catastrophe. Uh, you know, uh, people are camping on the streets, on the beach, uh, at best with some piece of shelter. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were driving through rivers of sewage. Uh, it's just a terrible, terrible uh, situation. The Palestinian government reported daily losses of almost 20 million U.S. dollars due to the ongoing Israeli aggression against the occupied territories. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Economy, the economic life cycle was disrupted by the decrease of cash flow due to the Israeli piracy of tax dues and the loss of almost half a million jobs since October 2023. They also warned that by the end of 2024, the domestic product expected to fall by more than 10%. The International Labour Conference and the Palestinian Central Statistics Office revealed that the unemployment rate in the Gaza Strip reached 79.1 percent and in the West Bank, 32 percent. Government authorities warned that billions of dollars will be needed to reverse the unprecedented destruction of its economy and infrastructure. The World Health Organization said recent attacks by Israeli occupation forces in the occupied West Bank are damaging healthcare infrastructure and hindering access to medical facilities. WHO officials have expressed concern about the recent escalation of violence and the ensuing health crisis in the region, as well as the arrest of health workers and patients. The agency has called for the active protection of civilians and health workers following some 480 attacks on the healthcare system in the West Bank since the start of the attacks on the Gaza Strip. WHO has counted an estimated 521 Palestinians killed in the occupied West Bank, including 126 children and another 5,200 people injured. Human rights organizations in Palestine accuse Israeli forces of targeting journalists in the Gaza Strip. Human rights organizations have issued a statement saying Israel is responsible for crimes and violations against journalists reporting on crimes committed by Israel in the Gaza Strip since October 7th. According to the statement, 150 journalists and other media employees have been killed during airstrikes perpetrated by Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, the Palestinian Journalist Union denounces that media professionals in Gaza keep exposing Israeli crimes despite the risks and sacrifices involved. We have a functional break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin American and Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Pause your break, don't go away. Welcome back. The so-called summit on peace in Ukraine ended in Switzerland without consensus in which the countries of the Global South did not subscribe to the final declaration. Saudi Arabia, Mexico, South Africa, Brazil and the United Arab Emirates were among the delegations that did not sign the preliminary document, considering it meaningless, since the meeting did not count with the presence of Russia, which is fundamental for reconciliation as one of the parties in conflict. With this meeting, Ukraine was seeking to increase diplomatic pressure on Moscow and to consolidate international support. In France, citizens took to the streets of several cities to protest against the far-right national rally ahead of upcoming elections to the French Parliament. Following the national rally surge in last Sunday's European elections, labor unions, student groups and rights groups called for rallies to oppose the anti-immigration Eurosceptic party. At least 150 marches were expected in cities including Marseille, Toulouse, Lyon and Lille. Protesters consider the far right's victory as a danger to European democracy while stressing the need for urgent responses in France in social and environmental matters as well as to the aspirations of its workers. I was very scared at the start of the week on Monday, Tuesday, etc. And progressively this week, I see what's happening. It's hope that's rising. What I see is a left that is in charge, in fact one that is capable of putting differences aside to agree on the essentials of coming together. And that was truly the case today, when I received more hope than fear. 
Peter Pellegrini took office as Slovakian head of state on Saturday with a call for unity and an end to the polarization in the country, which erupted a month ago with the assassination attempt on Prime Minister Robert Fico. Pellegrini takes the oath of office before the members of parliament in Reduta during the ceremony at the Slovak Philharmonic. During his speech, he called for seeking ways to move forward in union and expressed his aspiration to contribute to uniting Slovakia. Fico was shot last May 15th by a pensioner who declared to be against his policies after weeks of massive protests encouraged by the liberal and pro-European opposition against several of the measures of the executive of the left-wing populists and ultranationalists formed last October. With regard to the Russia and Ukraine conflict, Pellegrini is betting on a peace agreement. We must be sure that we will do everything to achieve peace and never allow further expansion of military conflict beyond our borders. After all, the desire for peace is natural and certainly not a celebration of the aggressor. Slovakia is, was and will remain a solid part of the European Union and the North Atlantic Alliance, but it will never be afraid to speak its sovereign voice from within them. In Chile, floods and landslides due to heavy rains associated with a frontal system left more than 11,000 people affected. A risk and disaster management committee reported that the worst hit region is Bio Bio, with 10,430 people affected. The committee reported that 5,941 houses suffered minor damages, 617 major damages, and seven were completely destroyed. The heavy rainfalls, winds, and floods also affected agriculture, leaving losses of nearly 200 million U.S. dollars. Weather experts forecast the arrival of a new front starting on Monday. In China, fire departments confirmed the extinction of a forest fire in the northern province of Shanxi after four days of continuous work. According to the Emergency Response Center, more than 2,200 firefighters equipped with 63 excavators and 88 water tankers participated in extinguishing the fire. They also said that local authorities resorted to cloud seeding operations to induce artificial rainfall over the flames. This is due to the complications that firefighters had to face because of the steep mountain slopes, high temperatures and windy weather conditions. The Emergency Response Center detailed that an investigation revealed that the wildfires may have been caused by lighting. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Tesla English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.